아, 안녕하세요. 매일매일 운동하기를 실천하고 있는 동탄 광코입니다. <웃음> 어제 런닝 했는데 밤 11시에 <웃음> 런닝을 뛰러 나왔거든요. 어, 비가 요즘에 비가 많이 오잖아요. 지금도 날씨가 흐린데 밤 안개가 껴서 너무 무서운 거예요. 사람도 한 명도 없고 조명이 있지만 내가 있는 기태만 밝고 나머지가 어두우니까 어 무서워서 한 20분 뛰다가 돌아왔네요 아, 온몸이 아리입니다 자 일단 오늘도 똑같이 운동을 하겠습니다 운동량은 팔굽혀펴기 10개씩 5세트 그리고 레그레이지 10개씩 5세트 그 다음에 플랭크 두번 하도록 하겠습니다 일단 플랭크를 지금 할게요. 먼저 한번 하고 마지막에 끝나고 한 번. 역시 운동할 때 CMA죠. 아, 요즘에 아주 탈레반 때문에 난립니다. You can bet we're trying to do that right now. The, the difficulties, uh, I mean, of, of an evacuation like this ha have been much discussed. The difficulties as the those who are executing the evacuation oh. begin to evacuate themselves. Oh, yeah. I see that only just uh, the difficulties oh. uh, just increase. Sure. I mean, they, we, we've got to start packing up now. It takes longer to get out of a situation like this than it does to sort of land and unroll everything. You got to do it in sequence. You got to pack it up. You got to get everything out of there: trucks, helicopters, drones, command and control units, comms. You got to figure out the sequence it's going in. You got to get the aircraft <sighs> marshal. You got to get the load plan set. Um, it, it, it's a complete operation, and it's being done under duress while they're still trying to bring people out. Now, my understanding today is the gates were mostly closed. And from the chit chat I pick up on my networks, there's a lot of people who try to get in who couldn't get in. And that heartbreak in itself, not only for those of us watching it and knowing some of these people on the outside, but I'm sure for the Marines and soldiers that are in there, they want to do that job. And, um, you know, we're relying on the Taliban for, for the defensive perimeter on the outside, sure. But we gave them the list of the names of the people that we want in there. And those are probably the same people the Taliban wants to, to harass or maybe kill. So we know from, from Chit Chat also that there's a network out there going after the people that work with us. So you can imagine the fear and the trepidation inside apartments in Kabul and other neighboring areas where people oh. are sort of saying, do I take the risk? Do I get out? Do I get to the airport? What am I going to do? How do I get past the Taliban? Yeah. Uh, it's just really a tragic time. I, we, are, we are just learning right now that the U.S. <sighs> Embassy in Kabul again warned U.S. citizens at a number of gates at the airport to, quote, leave immediately, citing security threats. The alert advised U.S. citizens, quote, to, quote, and I'm quoting, to avoid traveling to the airport and to avoid airport gates. Do you think this will, this will just keep up until the 31st, essentially not being able to go to the gates? Well, I think we've got to find some other means. And certainly there are still people working on the ground uh, in Kabul. There are contractors. There are people uh, who are Afghans who work for us. We've got some Americans still on the ground in their plain clothes guys who are able to pick people up and get them to the right locations. And yeah, the gates are closed, but under the right circumstances, of course, they could be open and uh, just to let a, a, a group through. So uh, we're gonna do everything we can, obviously, to get people out. But Anderson, think of the enormity of this task. Now, we've evacuated over 100,000 people. And that, that's pretty commendable. And we did it, boom, we put those troops in there and we got this thing going in a hostile environment. But we probably have one to two million Afghans 
who want out. They're trying to get out through Pakistan. They're trying to get out through Uzbekistan. But no, no matter how many we take out, there'll be many more. Yeah. There are judges we train, administrators we work with, people who speak English, people who work with the government. They don't trust what's going to happen next. They and their family uh, need to leave. Yeah. General Clark, I appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. For a closer look at what it's like right now in Kabul, we turn next to someone who's seen this final chapter unfold up close. Los Angeles Times foreign correspondent for the journalist Marcus Yan. So, Marcus, what is the, the mood like in Kabul after yesterday's attack, especially as the White House is warning of another possible terror attack in Kabul that being likely? Um, the mood so far, I mean, it's Kabul is pretty quiet. Uh, oh. I mean, I did go around and went, actually went to the airport today to, to see what it looked like. I mean, there were still more, we were still active and standing around outside looking to, you know, get into the airport. But as we get, make our way towards, you know, uh, at, uh, even the main civilian entrance of the airport or even towards the East Gate, uh, the Taliban fighters have actually moved away from their checkpoints and actually have uh, uh, moved out altogether as usual. So the entire area leading up to like these gates are empty now, basically, and, and devoid of people, basically, for the most part. Is that because the Taliban, I mean, you said they've moved away from checkpoints, but are they pr stopping people from going up? Uh, no, actually, they've actually moved away in, in a sense they've created a bigger circle around the airport. So I think they're just giving, are giving you know, airport security forces, you know, American security <sighs> forces space in a way. Um, I knew you were at the airport I was the day the explosion took pictures at the Abbey Gate where the, where the attack happened, and we're showing some of them. Can, can you just describe the scene and the security there before the blast? I mean, the scene was like any other scene. I mean, like, you know, <sighs> refugees were, were flowing in, you know, it was very calm, it was somewhat orderly. Um, everybody was uh, 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 hopeful, uh, you know, everybody was happy to be there, you know, calmly, you know, patiently waiting for their turn. Um, you know, in terms of security, it was a lot of the place. I mean, like, nobody was checking anybody's bag or, or doing any checks on the way into into this area. And, and the area, and, and, you know, civilians have to go through a Taliban checkpoint before coming in here. And the Taliban, I was in, we didn't really do any security checks coming in. So these so people like, were basically I mean, unchecked. I mean, that nobody had really done a thorough search of them to, until the U.S. did. Correct. And and this area, you said people were happy to be there. Is this an area where people they knew that they were going to get out, uh, or or these people uh, who still were not sure if if they would if their documents would be accepted? I mean, I think there's a sense of uncertainty, but I think. That, I think there was a common belief that once you got past the Taliban and into past, you know, uh, 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 British and American military checks, I mean, checkpoints, um, you were basically in the airport, even though this was not part of the airport yet. You returned after the explosion, and I just want to show some of, of, of what you, some of the images that, that you took. Um, I, I think some of these are also from outside the hospital. What, what did you hear from people on the ground? I mean, we spoke to, I spoke to one survivor that basically was about, he said he was about seven to 10 meters away from the blast and all he saw was a flash and, and he blacked out. And I guess he fell into the canal part of that area. I mean, he fell into the canal and he was all soaked and his brother had to pull his, him out and, uh, and he didn't remember much after that. And he remember, but he did remember waking up with a piece of human flesh on his shoulder. Um, and it was just utter madness. And, and obviously the death toll uh, went up today from an uh, Afghan official. La last week you were, you, were, you were punched, you were beaten up by members of the Taliban. You wrote about it for the LA Times. And in part of that account, you, you said, someone tugged on my camera strap and I felt the kinetic energy connection of a fist to the side of my head. A Taliban fighter had emerged out of nowhere and sucker punched me. He was a tall, burly man with a well-groomed, thick beard. He started screaming in Dari, the local language, pointing at our cameras. I mean, it sounded terrifying. What happened next? And and, and do you fear that this is a specter of things to come? 
I mean, it's a it, it, it's a it's a sign of how volatile things can get. Ultimately, I mean, I had, uh, I had, I had brought up a complaint to the, the Taliban spokesperson, and uh, and and for the most part, he seemed pretty unapologetic, and 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 mentioned that we should just use. And they had introduced this new accredit media accreditation system, and it's basically a big white flip placard that we have to carry around now uh, in order to do our work. And we, I've had this a couple couple times now and it's you know i've had mixed results with it some taliban fighters recognize it some you know don't really care about it and just most tell me not to take pictures uh marcus yam i, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us thank you thank you for having me on oh well, now we want you to meet a u.s army veteran and a gold star wife whose husband died while serving in afghanistan in 2012. she has family members who've been working with the u.s military in afghanistan for the entire war she says and as you might imagine they are now desperate to get out her name is uh fatima and we're not going to provide her last name or her location because we want to keep her family members as safe as possible i first spoke to her earlier today on my cnn.com show full circle and we were so struck by what she had to say and her situation that I want to continue that conversation uh, with you here. So, uh, Fatima, thanks so much for, for coming back. I appreciate you uh, giving us the time. Y you immigrated to the U.S. from Afghanistan, uh, I believe it was in the late 90s. You eventually joined the U.S. military in 2008 after you graduated high school, you served overseas. That's where you met your husband, who was killed uh, while serving in Afghanistan. Um, Talk about your family. They have spent, you say, decades helping the U.S. military as well. How many family members are still now trying to get out? Um, right now, I had uh, at least two different family members from my mother's side come to me and say, hey, I had eight years in Kandahar, and I have no paperwork, or I have my paperwork, and it was burned, and there's... Um, there's a lot of people that are just kind of in search of the certain paperwork that you need because they're being told that you don't have this specific thing that they're not going to accept you. And some of them kind of take that and take that as a broken heart and kind of keep it moving. But um, I just want to say thank you for having me here again. And I think my family, I know, is not going to, like I said before, we're not going to be able to get everybody out. Um, we can't get everybody out of the country either. And we just need to take a breather and understand kind of our capacity, but you're, 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 I say top you're, of my head 20 people, sorry. Your brother has uh, has a, a U.S. passport and was in uh, was in Kabul. He stayed longer, uh, he could have gotten out, but he stayed longer in order to help other family members who were in the process to get a special immigrant visa. Was he able to get them out? Um, he was able to get them out, and that's something I'm really happy about, is he waited weeks, and he went with them to the gates every single day, and every day he got an opportunity that was like, hey, well, you're an American citizen, we can get you on a plane, and he was like, no, 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 because I know once I leave, these guys are going to be left wow. to wow. just kind of go on their how, own. How many days was he at the gate for, or were he, was he going to gates? He was going to gates for five days, wow. and... Every day, early in the morning, because that's when uh, everybody gets there, early in the morning and they leave at night. Um, he told me, he took pictures of one of the nights and he was like, I was that at that gate for 24 hours and we still didn't get anywhere. And it was because he was an American citizen, but because they were SIV applicants that it would just, um, they were like, no, well, we're not accepting that right now. And it just kind of, the gates as the like different nations take over the gate control they also say okay well no we're only accepting this person we're only accepting these people so it's like the acceptance kind of goes it's very fluid and nobody really knows when so that's why there is a slew of people at the gates i feel you know personal opinion. when i talked to you first uh, earlier today you talked about heartbreak and uh, and I was thinking about it afterward, and I, and I wanted to, to ask you about it tonight. Uh, I, I can imagine your heart uh, breaking in all different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a veteran, hearing of the deaths of 13 service members, 12 Marines, and, and, and uh, I believe an Army uh, soldier, um, your heart must break as a veteran, as somebody who lost a husband in Afghanistan, there's that heartache as well uh, with the, the what's happened now 
uh, to, to Afghanistan, to have family members there, some who haven't, won't be able to, to get out. And as an as a, as a Afghan yourself, uh, someone who was born there, I mean, it's, it's how are you doing? I am very tired. <laughs> I was just going to say I'm very tired, but it's um, you got to kind of push through because I know there. My tiredness doesn't matter. Um, I was actually just talking to a, one of the extraction teams, and they're like, "Hey, man, I'm going to take an hour nap." And I know that girl has been up for the past 18 hours because I've been up with her. Um, so just, I think that is keeping me going. The amount of. Uh, the amount of support and the amount of hard work that the veterans on ground are really working on and the military that's on ground that I'm in contact with that are doing their own different extractions, it really helps you kind of get some motivation and you see past your, uh, you see past your feelings. Um, my heart is absolutely broken for the 12 families that are going to get the worst knock um, on their door. I know when I got that knock, I shut the door back in my first iron's face, uh, and then I felt awful about it because I, should, I would never shut a door in someone's face. I just I didn't want to believe it. Um, my heart aches for those kids. My heart aches for those families. You know uh, what that knock on the door is like. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. You see that car, and you're just like, no, I said it was just just a dream. It's it's gonna go away. It's a dream. Um, I did that to myself for a year, thinking everything was a dream. Mm -hmm. But um, the issue that, sorry, whew, those Marines that uh, we lost, they, I was in contact with people that were on ground and the Marines were the only ones who were outside the gate. Um, no story is gonna tell about the amazing things that they did do and how they really were trying to make things easy for the Afghan people to get through. And these are like my, these are my people and it makes me, it breaks my heart that they lost their lives trying to help my people get to safety. Um, Awful. That's, yeah, my, the veteran in me is crying, the Afghan in me is crying because I'm, all of the innocent lives that were lost and the fact that we're, why is there continuously lives being lost? The gold star wife in me is sad for all the people that have to get that phone call and they have to get that face-to-face -face meeting with two officials that just show up at your door it's very jumbled it's um and then having to tell my family members like i can't help you i'm so sorry i cannot help you i i have no capacity to help you and uh, my cousin had sent an email about my uncle saying hey can you get my daughter out please get my daughter out and i'm just like i i wish i could i really do and i think that's a million broken pieces but well Fatima we're good <laughs> I, I appreciate you you talking uh, to us tonight and and giving us a window into what what you and so many uh, families are, are going through and I appreciate uh, your service and I, I'm sorry for your losses and uh, thank you for for being with us thank you so much sadly Sadly, we just learned the name of the second of 13 service members killed yesterday. Uh, he is Marine Corporal Dagan Page. He was just 23 years old. He was raised in Red Oak, Iowa and Omaha, Nebraska as well. His family tells us he was a longtime Boy Scout, a hockey fan with a fondness for hot dogs, and they say a real soft spot for dogs as well. He was a dog person. Dagan, they say, will always be remembered for his tough outer shell and his giant heart and for being a jungle gym to his younger brothers and sisters, Marine Corporal Dagan Page. Next, biographer of President Biden, Evan Osnos, joins us, talking about the, what's driving the president, even as the second Kabul attack is likely, and a new embassy warning has just gone out to Americans to get away from the airport gates now and stay away from the airport right now. We'll be back.
I think that we are going to, at least for the foreseeable future, have a different way of utilizing the office. Uh, there's a very popular belief that the office will be more of a gathering place, more of a place for meetings and interaction to drive collaboration, to drive culture, but not using it as a nine to five every day the way it was historically. The term that's being used generally to describe this is some kind of hybrid approach to using the office, allowing folks more flexibility to not have to come in every day and to not necessarily come in at set hours, but the vast majority will be coming back for some portion of the week, probably three to four days. The incentive to bring people back in will be making the uh, experience of going to the office that much more pleasant than it might have been historically. And I think that is what's going to drive people back to the office uh, uh, in the short term. Embassy in Kabul is once again warning Americans to immediately leave the gates outside Hamid Karzai International Airport. Others are being told to avoid the airport and not go there. This is, of course, a chilling repeat of the warning that preceded yesterday's bombing, and it's yet more pressure on the administration. We're going to talk about how this president operates in moments like this. CNN contributor and New Yorker staff writer Evan Osnos, author of Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. So, Evan, we spoke briefly yesterday about how personal these deaths often are for the president and, and his family. Obviously, his son Bo was an Army major who later lost his battle with cancer. He talked about yesterday the black hole that's left after a death like that. Um, how do you think he plans to approach these conversations with, the, with these family members? I mean, it's, it's something he has, certainly obviously has experience with. He does. You know, this is the first time he's doing it now as commander-in-chief, but it's been a part of his public life for a long time. And, you know, he sort of developed some techniques that he really uses when he talks to people in this situation. One of the things is he never says, I know exactly what you're feeling, because he doesn't. As he says, you know, I can say I know some of what you're feeling. One thing he often recommends to people, he did it in his, in his own life, is he says, keep a pad and pen by your bed. And as the time goes by, you will make a mark and rate your day. Give yourself an assessment of how you're doing. How, how are you struggling? How are you recovering? because only then will you be able to sense if there's any improvement over time. He's given that advice, for instance, to parents who lost children at the Sandy Hook massacre in Connecticut. Um, the other thing he does sometimes is he will draw on his own experience. He will say, as he did to a, a woman named Amanda Barry in Cleveland who'd been kidnapped and then released, he said, you know, I was basically your age, about 28, 29 years old when I lost my wife and my daughter, and here I am. Oh, I'm still yeah. here. And she said later, you know, oh. that, experience. Just hearing oh. him say, I am still here, she said, there is something valuable in that, and if we mm. could get through it, then maybe I can too. You, you pointed out earlier tonight that the card the president carries around in his pocket, this is the first time of his presidency that it, it's been updated. Uh, it's a card with the number of, of U.S. troops killed on, on his watch. It's true. I mean, this is the first time since he's taken office that he has now uh, deaths in Afghanistan that will be reflected on that card he carries. It's you know, there is this very personal piece of this for him. And uh, he's he, one of the things that I think gives form in his mind to how to deal with grief is something that came oh. to him a few years ago. Actually, it was oh. Vicki Kennedy, the widow of Ted Nathan Kennedy, who gave that. him a letter that had been oh, written yeah. by Joseph Kennedy, who oh. after all lost four of his children, including uh, John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. And he gave advice to 